of, of messaging. But again, people seem to be selecting into these communities by picking media that are congruent with their personalities. We'll talk more about personality. Mr. Graham will talk more about personality shortly, um, and, um, and their existing um, views. But it is worth noting that until the government brought it up, most of these things, uh, most of these issues on um, homosexuality, on um, uh, the rights of religious believers, uh, were not really a big part of the Russian political discourse. Right? Um, so, um, moving on to the um, opposition. Right? Uh, look at the data that underpins this in a, in a moment, but we, we find three um, uh, headline points. Right? And in talking about the opposition, what we're again talking about is this, this movement that emerges in the post Bologna period. One of the things we wanted to look at in the ensuing years is, does it disappear? We might expect, in the face of coercion, in the, fact, in the face of marginalization ideologically, uh, that it would begin to disappear. Um, and certainly, if you focus on the organizational structures, some of the structures, the movement organizations that came up in the Bolotnaya moment, we do see it begin to, to fade. But actually, what we seem to see over time is that the movement retains a tremendous ability to mobilize people. Um, uh, to mobilize around ideas, to mobilize around events, uh, particularly around events, um, but that that power resides not in structures, not in organizations, and not in individuals, but in frames, right? in explanatory frameworks, in sets of ideas and interpretations that um, make people angry um, in the face of, of, of a certain political um, or, uh, or other kind of, of event or happening. Right? Um, we see significant movement and fluidity of individuals and, and ideas across parts of the movement, right? across organizations, across uh, iterations of, uh, of protests. So we see um, the terms, the ideas, the frames again that are being used from one moment to another, from one year to another, um, becoming increasingly similar. Um, and um, uh, so we seem to, to, to have what, what looks like kind of a network of, uh, of networks uh, in which the overall sort of ecosystem of these organizations and of these movements seems to be much more important than any of the individual um, uh, organizations and relationships themselves. Right? Um, and we do see a growing coherence and consistency of anti-regime uh, uh, framing compared to the, um, to the pre bologna period. Right? So where, where do we find this? We started by looking uh, primarily at um, uh, online social media, not as, something, not as an object of study, but as a way of studying the movement um, uh, itself. And, we uh, sort of refer to this as data-intensive process tracing. We're looking at the relationships of things that are moving through this data to try to piece out a story of what's going on. So we do a series of event-based uh, studies, which allows us uh, to uh, tie together both online and, and, and offline um, uh, observations, so we can see um, uh, what seems to be relating to what. Um, we um, uh, recognize, uh, of course, that online data are not a perfect reflection of the movement, but they allow us to, to, to ask and begin to answer some questions, and this is based on um, a sample of, of about 17,000 uh, uh, participants uh, from 18 public uh, Facebook protest groups. Uh, was, uh, we talk about how the groups were selected, if, if you have questions, I want to spend time on that now, uh, arranged in sort of seven snapshots of the network uh, between 2012 and 2015, um, ending in, in, in August of this year, so really up, up um, to almost right now, right? And this is, um, hard to see. Um, <laughs> This is essentially what we're looking at, right? So this is what the network, the protest network, looks like in the 2nd and 3rd of March, 2012, right? The 4th of March was the presidential election, so this is the peak uh, mobilizational moment for people who wanted to have an impact on what was going to happen with this election um, that year. Everybody knew he was going to win, but nobody was terribly, nobody, this contingent was terribly happy about it, right? Um, this is what um, the movement looks like when you bring together all of the data that we, um, um, uh, collected in the ensuing uh, three years. Right? Again, we don't capture the periods between the waves, but we do. Um, um, uh, uh, we are able to, to, to bring them together to see that what the general structure looks like over time. Right. So if you look at the sort of the, the, the March 2002 movement, right, we said this huge grouping over here. This is a, a, a community online called We Believe in the Bolotnik Bolshevik Project. We sure we were on on, on Bolotnik's car and we will be back. Right. Um, if you look over at this map, you can find that group way up here. Right? Um, the largest group here is a group called Mikrotiv Misha, just for the in Yellow Ukraine. Right? We're against um, uh, uh, interference in Ukraine's internal affairs. Right? So the question we wanted to ask was how, how we get from here to there and what we learned from, from that um, 
process, right? This is what it looks like in terms of numbers, and this is, I think, the first surprise in the story, right? So, um, in the um, in this this network, which we think captures the vast majority of activity going on at any given time, right? We find that on second and third of March, two thousand twelve, uh, we had about two thousand people active in the network, right? Um, so you would have thought of that as a peak, right? You would have thought that the network should have, in terms of what we're reading in the newspapers and talking to people, begun to go into abeyance, begin begin to go into into decline. And yet we find that the next time we return to the network on the fifth and seventh, the fifth seventh of July, two thousand fourteen, right? Uh, we've got almost six thousand people active in the network. Right? The vast majority of those people are in the uh, anti-war community. We both we shared this about, 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 right? Um, that goes up considerably uh, up to just over 8,000 um, in the next wave in September 21st, 22nd, 2014. September 21st was the peace march uh, in Moscow and St. Petersburg, right? Notably, we've got about 8,000 people online in the network, right? But we've got about 75,000 people out on the streets uh, in, uh, in Russia, about 50,000 we think in Moscow, and 25,000 probably in St. Petersburg, right? So uh, there has been this traditional argument that, uh, that we have slacktivism, right? That we have more people coming out online. It doesn't seem that the, at first glance to be what we're seeing, right? Um, we're actually seeing more people coming out on the streets where it might actually be safer. Because if you click online, right? We don't know how many people are reading. This is based on people who are liking, sharing, posting, commenting, um, uh, that sort of thing. That leaves a mark. Right? And um, the government is unable to find you uh, if, if they want to, which we know that they, they did particularly in the May 6th Bologna, uh, uh investigations. Right? Um, whereas if you come out in the streets and there are a few thousand other people there, you might actually be more anonymous. But that's uh, a hypothesis we need to, to, to take up further. Right? Then, of course, we do see it um, uh, come down. We, um, the next wave is the 27th, 28th of February, 28th, the 27th of February, 2000. 15 um, is the day that Nimsov was killed uh, in Moscow. Right? We then come back again and look uh, later on, on the, the 1st and 2nd of March 2015, which is the, um, uh, the march was supposed to be the spring march in Moscow uh, against Putin's policies, but it turns it into a memorial march for Nimsov. Right? And then again the 5th and 7th of July 2015, which we expected to be uh, a quiet period, but which reflects a lot of uh, mobilization, particularly in, in sort of the Navalny camp ahead of, of the upcoming elections. Um, so we won't go through this in detail, but what you see is um, a lot of movement um, uh, in terms of uh, where movement activity seems to be at any given time. Right? You don't see any organization that seems to be a, um, um, uh, a, a central sort of locus of mobilizing activity throughout this period, right? It starts very much in sort of the Bolotne groups, it then moves into the anti-war movement, it then moves throughout some of the political parties, ends up with Navalny, but I think that there's no reason to believe that that is then the trend that we're on. Like the likelihood is, if we were to collect this data two months from now, we would see a very different structure again, right? Um, look at this, if you see where, where the, how the anti-war network itself um, uh, came to be and where people were coming from. Only about, at least in our sample, 1% of the people who we found in the anti-war movement had been in the Bolotne movement before. Right? Um, uh, in the first wave, what we found that about 99% of the people in the anti-war movement, again, had, uh, had never shown up in our data before. Now, our data are limited, so they may have been involved before. Uh, in, in other ways, uh, but certainly the vast majority seem to have been uh, new. Now that recruiting power declines uh, over time, right? But we find, and we don't like put it all up on the uh, on the screen, but we find that when the, the, the Navalny campaign heats up, um, we find very much the same thing, that they're bringing in more people, right? Um, uh, people, new people who hadn't been um, uh, involved before. So the, move, the, the movement seems to, to maintain, although with different organizational structures, the ability to keep bringing in um, uh, new people, not something you would expect from a movement in decline or in uh, abeyance necessarily. Right? Um, skip that. Um, the last point. Right? In um, uh, this summer, we saw two uh, protest movements, small-scale protest movements, emerge in Moscow around uh, parks. Right? One at uh, Tarfyanka uh, in uh, Lasinle Ostrov Park up in uh, north. Eastern Moscow, and one um, at um, uh, and in Park Druzhba at Rishnoy Vokzal in northwestern Moscow, across Street Mike Park. Um, and um, the, these were protests against 
um, uh, uh, construction that the local residents didn't want to see happen in their park, in one case a church, in another place it's not actually clear what they're going to be building, but somebody's building something. Um, and uh, you see uh, localized protest groups that seem to be drawing in new people, mostly local residents, right? Um, and uh, you see some, this is sort of what the network map looks uh, like within these groups um, for uh, the period of, of July and August of this year, right? Um, not a huge amount of activity, some sharing though, so you do see, see communication between, say, the Tarfianka people and the, and the Park Druzhwe people. Um, but interestingly, what you see if you read through this is framing that is almost indistinguishable from the Bolotne movement framing, uh, from the Navarrenli groups framing, right? Um, and, uh, whereas in the past, if you looked at these kinds of not in my backyard movements that you really had in Russia since at least uh, uh, the 2000s, uh, the early 2000s, um, is that most of those movements and historically would have not wanted to get anywhere near opposition groups. They would not have wanted to get anywhere near politicians. And at some point in their history, they probably would have written a petition to Putin asking him to intercede. Right? These people don't do that. Right? They invite Navalny, uh, particularly because Navalny brings lawyers, right? but they, 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 they invite people who have the experience of mobilization and dealing with the police and dealing with local uh, governments in. Right? They invited anybody who they think is a sympathizer. They adopt, again, the same frame and explanatory frameworks about you know, the party of swindlers and thieves and things like that. Right? Um, but they very clearly see the regime, certainly United Russia, and in most cases Putin, as part of the problem and not an eventual part of the solution. Um, and uh, we think that represents uh, both a, a very real shift from the pre Bolotne period, but also uh, says something about the durability of this movement as a whole, right? It is inserting frames, inserting understandings of how politics works in Russia into um, uh, communities where it wouldn't otherwise um, uh, have been. Uh, and with that, um, I will hand over to Graham. So as Sam mentioned, we've been working on this for three years, so we managed to come up with more than one story to tell. Um, and part of the job now is to try and kind of put it all back into one story. Um, so I'm going to focus on a, on a different part of the story, a different stream of research that we've been doing. Um, but I think that, that, that is quite consonant with, with some of these things that Sam just talked about and add some other dimensions too. Um, one of the things that, that, that struck observers and, and people doing sociological surveys of the, of the protesters around the time uh, of the Bolotnoi movement was that there was a significant difference between the social makeup of the population at large and the social makeup of the people in the, in, of the protesters. Yes, there was people from all sorts of parts of society there, but on average, people in the protest tended to be more educated, they tend to be uh, wealthier, uh, they tended to get their information more from online sources rather than television, uh, and they tended to be more urban than the population uh, at large. Uh, this actually, in comparative perspective, is, is true in authoritarian regimes around the world where uh, authoritarians now face more uh, of a threat, usually from educated urbanites, uh, than they do from the kind of classical revolutions that come from you know, peasant uprisings uh, or, or, or urban workers. So this is, in this sense, Russia uh, fits very uh, clearly into, into a broader, broader pattern. So what we wanted to do was to find out, okay, so we, have, we know that there's these protesters that, that are urban and educated uh, on the streets, there's also lots of urban and educated people who are not on the streets. Um, so can we get a sense of how deep and how wide the disenchantment that we're seeing actually is in, in, those, uh, in this demographic? And then can we understand better what are the factors that shape uh, the patterns across this key group? And so what we did was we, we started doing a bunch of surveys. We uh, did online surveys uh, where, you did, where you, in order to select in, you had to have uh, some university education, uh, kind of middle class income, um, and you know, to be on an online survey or online, um, so that's helpful. Uh, and we did a series of them going back to around the presidential elections in 2012 up until uh, uh, July uh, 2014. Um, and what we found was that uh, in, in, in each of these surveys, and I'm going to focus particularly on uh, October 2013 and then for obvious reasons July uh, 2014, what we found was that initially at least this group uh, of educated urbanites was different from the rest of the population. Support for, uh, for Putin measured in all sorts of different ways here. This is just a kind of map of, of, of voting intentions, but in all sorts of different dimensions, these people were different from the population at large. Uh, and so we wanted to understand why that was. And then when we, when we re-ran a survey, and I'll say how we did that in July, 
2014, uh, after Crimea, all of a sudden they're not different at all. Uh, and they look very, very, very similar to the population of Mars. So I want to explain sort of this pattern here of support and, and non-support, and then explain why you get this big rallying uh, effect uh, later on. So to cut a very long story short, um, I'm going to give, just give you some of the, the, the highlights of, of, of what we found. Um, and if you want to know more about how we found it and, and, and what the underlying data look like, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but essentially, we found something that we found a number of sort of classical features that are kind of well known in the literature that people <laughs> talked about a lot, and we found out that they were that they were a pretty good guide to, to a certain extent in understanding patterns of support and opposition amongst our educated urbanites. We found, for example, uh, that people who were doing better economically tended to support the regime more. And this is the classic Dan Treisman uh, finding that we've all kind of known in our in our hearts for a very long time, uh, and it's easy to see in the data up to a certain point. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that later. We found that public sector workers tend to be more supportive of the, of the regime. Again, no, no surprise there. And we found that older people, pensioners, tend to be more supportive of the regime. Again, uh, not, not, not much of a surprise there. And we found that to a certain extent, depending on how you measure it, women tend to be more supportive of the regime, although it, it varies across uh, different kinds of measures. <coughs> so far, so, so standard story. Um, but in these surveys, we, we, we tried a lot of different ways of trying to understand why uh, people who were similarly socioeconomically located actually had quite different and, and, and often like really mutually uh, contradictory and opposing positions. And one thing that we that we that we dug into was um, uh, a, a, an enormous literature in in, in psychology and social psychology, uh, which looks at the role of people's personalities on on, on outcomes in their lives. Uh, and psychologists have shown over 50 years or, or, or more of research now that. There are a number of identifying personality, personality traits. Personality traits are, are sort of things that you you acquire partly through genetics and then early, early childhood experiences that you then that characterize your outlook on, on, on life and your interpretation of your experience for the rest of your life. And they change very little over time. And psychologists have connected these things to everything from how long you're likely to live, to how sick you're going to get, to how you're going to respond to being sick, to whether you're going to get married, uh, to what kind of job you're going to do, to how well you're going to do in that job, to whether you're going to go to prison. Um, and then political scientists finally thought, well, maybe this has got something to do with politics too. Um, and there's been a recent work in the last sort of, uh, five or six years, uh, especially in the United States, but also in Western Europe, looking at the connection between people's uh, personality and, and, and how they interact with politics and understand politics. And there's basically two personality traits that come out in every single one of these studies and democracies about people's uh, about the relationship between these two, two spheres. And one is that people who are uh, open to new ideas, open to new experiences, tend to be more liberal, right? And people who are concerned with details and concerned with order tend to be more conservative, right? This makes, makes a certain amount of intuitive sense. So we asked Russians the same, or asked our online urbanites the same kinds of questions as, as Western social scientists have been doing, and we found something completely different, right? We didn't find that openness to experience or ideas was particularly important nor did we find this kind of uh, attention to detail to matter all that consistently. What we found was something, something different that doesn't matter in Western politics matter the most. And that is uh, a desire for social acceptance. People who really value social acceptance, who value fitting in, uh, were much more likely to be more supportive of, of President Putin. They were more likely to watch state television. They were more committed to the Orthodox Church. They were more likely to be homophobic. Um, they were more likely to be willing to sacrifice freedom for order. In other words, a whole range of positions uh, that, that fit with support for regime depend very heavily on this desire for social acceptance. I mean, this is an effect that, that's huge and you can't make it go away in any of the data. And I think this is extremely important. Um, what we think here is what we're seeing is that um, one of the central supports of popular legitimacy for the regime is highly situational that it depends on people's perceptions of what the appropriate and uh, non-wave-making form of behavior is. Um, and when that uh, perspective of, of appropriateness changes, so their attitudes on, on all of these other regime positions that, 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 that are listed on the screen is likely to change too. In other words, these deep personality traits that, that they've had that they have all their whole life, the relationship between that and politics is situational and, and can change, could change very rapidly. This is very much a, along the lines of the, the image that comes to my mind when I think about this um, is uh, Václav Havel's work on the power of the powerless, 
um, the idea of the of the need for for in his case totalitarian regimes to maintain uh, an appearance of unanimity. Um, and when that appearance of unanimity goes, the regime disappears overnight, and we're all surprised by it. Um, and I think what we see here in, in 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 Russia today is that a lot of the support that we're seeing for Putin is not a mistake. It's not a surveying error. Um, but it is uh, something that, 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 that could go away very quickly if the, if the context and the need for unanimity changes. Um, so that was the situation in October, all up to October 2013. And of course, we get Yanukovych gets, gets, gets overthrown, Crimea gets annexed, war happens in Ukraine. Um, and we see nationally this huge support for the president uh, increase, a huge sort of emotional wave sweep across the country uh, that, 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 that um, was, uh, would have been unexpected before. And so what we did was decided to go back and re-interview uh, our respondents from before and see what happened to them. And we, we, we tried what's called a panel design. We, we basically recontacted the same individuals that we had asked questions of before, and then we asked them similar sets of questions again. And this allows you to, to get a real causal leverage on, okay, what has it actually changed um, to, to make your, 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 your opinion uh, move? And what we found, first of all, was that our educated organizers had moved. And our educated organizers had moved dramatically. Um, and support for, so the, the dark blue uh, uh, columns are, this is the approval for, for Putin on a, on a one to four scale, the standard Levada question. Um, the dark blue is October 2013, the light blue is uh, from July 2014. And what we see is that support for, for approval of Putin goes up from somewhere around 50%, which is below the national, considered to be below the national uh, polls to, to over 80%, which is in line uh, with the national polls at that time. And interestingly, what we find is the effect is pretty much linear, right? It's not that those who are in the middle all kind of sweep towards Putin, but at each level of support, we find kind of a, <clears throat> an intercept shift uh, to the right, which I think is really uh, fascinating. We also found that the emotional kind of turmoil that, that, that was sweeping the nation was also very obvious in our group. We asked people on a one to seven scale how much pride they felt in, in, in Russia's leadership. Um, and what we found was that before Crimea, the answer was not very much. Um, and after Crimea, the answer was, 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 was a lot. So before Crimea, there was somewhere uh, of the order of 15% of people would, would agree that they showed at, at least some pride and only 2% said a lot. Uh, and then that had, had increased to, to nearly 40% after Crimea. So, uh, so the educated urbanites were as involved in this big wave, this big rally around the flag effect uh, as everybody else. Um, what we did was we then tried to try to uh, try to unpick different parts of this process. What was what was causing this big big rally effect? And to summarize uh, the results for you, basically there's there's three main factors that we find are really important in this. Um, two of them are, are, are bottom up, population based factors, and then one is top down. This is what uh, what Sam meant at the beginning when he talked about uh, the political regime being being co constituted. That this is not just uh, people being told what to think from above and that everyone blindly following, but that there's demand for this kind of stuff coming from, from below. Uh, and these three factors, patriotism uh, on the one hand and pride in, in, in the person of, of, of Putin, um, uh, interact with state television, with propaganda from the top to produce this huge uh, increase in, in support. Let me say a little bit more about each of these in, in, in turn. One of the big findings, uh, and this fits with, with some uh, uh, um, uh, work that, that, that Henry and, 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 and Misha have done as well, that, that patriotism plays a big role in this. One of the things that happened between uh, over around Crimea essentially was that patriots and nationalists who had not been terribly enthusiastic about the Putin regime became very enthusiastic about the Putin regime. And so you, they brought into this uh, new uh, uh, sector of the, of the, of the, of the population uh, fully on, on board. We also found that uh, People who watched more state television became more patriotic in this period. So not only were patriots who being brought in, but people were being turned on to patriotism. Um, but that this effect was was kind of was interesting. It wasn't a kind of okay, unlike the pride, it wasn't an over over the, the overall everybody becomes more patriotic. It tended to be people who were already watching state television became more intense in their patriotism. And in fact, overall, we didn't find any real increase. In levels of patriotism, we measured it in terms of a number of different things, in association with the, with the Orthodox Church, uh, <clears throat> adherence to, to the Russian state, the Russian nation, or, or, or Russian culture. Um, in terms of pride in the president, what we found was that those who expressed pride in back in October uh, were much more likely to 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 to, to rally to the to the leadership, and unlike 
patriotism and pride has, has increased uh, across the board. But interestingly, pride in the leadership and patriotism seem to be pretty much unrelated uh, from one another. Uh, the way I think about this is being uh, two different currents in this in this stream, uh, in this river of, 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 of support. And they're, 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 they're actually separable and not, not that closely related to one another. So there's a personal effect, and then there's a patriotic uh, effect. Uh, and then finally, as, as, as we all know, um, or all think we know, um, state television had, had, does have a big effect on approval. People who watched more state television before uh, Crimea became much more patriotic, much more proud, uh, and, and much more uh, approving of the, of the Putin uh, regime. Uh, between October and, and, and July. What's really interesting to me, though, is that this effect, though strong within this subgroup, is not across the board, because what happens is you, you, the state television was not able to attract a whole lot of new viewers. That The viewing pattern figures are actually pretty unchanged over the course of these two periods. We had a slight increase in the number of people that watched state TV daily, but the effect of reach of television is really limited by the sort of media selection effects that Sam was talking about. Um, so to sum up, I'm going to sum up um, in two stages and talk about the regime support and then talk about what that implies for the future. Um, the basic elements of, super, of regime support do include classical factors like economic performance. Right? And let's not forget about that because it, that's, that's, that I think you know, is suspended temporarily for Crimea, but, but it, it's been a feature for a very long time. Um, another major feature of regime support in, in, in Russia is this uh, desire for social acceptance. And as I mentioned, I think this is a very fluid uh, feature uh, and could change quickly. Um, and that in the atmosphere of crisis around, around Crimea, there's been these other streams of, of, of patriotism, pride, and, and propaganda that have been brought in. Going forward, I think what we need to remember is this co-constitution. That the state and the, is, 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 a, is a player in this, but the Russian population is an, an active participant both in the construction of the opposition that Sam talked about and of the regime. Uh, that I focused on. Um, and so we, we need to, if, if we're thinking about how long things are going to go, we need to think about uh, the, 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 the regime as not being entirely in control of this process and there uh, being un, unexpected forces from society coming up. Consequently, uh, if you think about these kind of rally effects that we've seen, this really does look like a classical rally effect that you saw in the United States uh, around 9 11 that, 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 that Margaret Thatcher had around uh, the Falklands era. Um, and what, what we've learned from those processes is that the uniformity of messaging is really important. Once the elite, once the public starts to hear different messages coming from different parts of the elite, then, then these bubbles and popularity burst uh, and go away. Um, and so one of the priority for the regime is going to be maintaining elite unity around uh, the, the message. Um, the other thing that we know is that once the public stops thinking the security threat is real and serious, then the bubble goes away. Um, and so, uh, you know, somewhat scarily, I think. Uh